Here the visit as a foreign guy, a visit to Teatro Molimpico. Okay, we have a, a nice program, but before starting this program, I would like to ask you to Francesco Rocco, that is uh, our mayor of Vicenza, uh, to introduce uh, with the greetings of the town of Vicenza. Okay, please. Sì, grazie Presidente. Thank you very much. Faccio con la traduzione, allora perfetto, vado lentamente. Buongiorno a tutte e a tutti i presenti. È un grande onore per me portarvi il saluto a nome della città di Vicenza, una città che oggi si sente orgogliosa di ospitare un momento di cultura e di medicina così importante. Voglio subito ringraziare l'amico presidente dell'Accademia Olimpica e medico patologo, dottor Gaetano Tiene, per questo evento che ancora una volta andrà ad esaltare il nostro territorio. Da sempre, da secoli, all'avanguardia sia per quanto riguarda l'architettura sia per quanto riguarda la sanità in generale. Do il benvenuto ai prestigiosi ospiti a partire dalla delegazione dell'Università della Pennsylvania, la cui scuola di medicina fu fondata da John Morgan, che nel 1764 si mise in viaggio in Veneto per scoprire le bellezze dei monumenti storici e per confrontarsi con il già alto livello di conoscenza medica della nostra regione. Un saluto particolare a Larry Jackson, rettore dell'Università della Perman di Filadelfia e all'Accademico Olimpico, non lo vedo Guido Beltramini, che evidentemente sono in questo momento, comunque porto i saluti anche a lui, ricordando che oggi pomeriggio sarò lieto di avervi i miei graditi ospiti a Palazzo Trissino sede storica del comune del municipio di Vicenza. È davvero affascinante il tema trattato sia le influenze di Vicenza e del Veneto sullo sviluppo della medicina e dell'architettura negli Stati Uniti, a conferma della vocazione mondiale della nostra città, testimoniata proprio quest'anno dal cinquecentesimo anniversario del primo viaggio intorno al mondo di Magellano, raccontato dallo storico cronista vicentino Antonio Pigafetta. Vi auguro quindi un buon lavoro nell'ambito di questa bellissima iniziativa organizzata dall'Accademia Olimpica di Vicenza, che ancora una volta ringrazio, ed intesa con l'Università degli Studi di Padova e con il patrocinio del nostro Comune di Vicenza e del Consiglio regionale del Veneto qui rappresentato da Antonio Franzina, da dottor Antonio Franzina. Vi aspetto quindi da noi in Palazzo Trissino oggi pomeriggio, alle 14.30, avremo modo di farvi conoscere anche il nostro palazzo monumentale e, e portarvi un saluto appunto ulteriore a nome della città. Grazie. Yes, time of uh, Dr. Professor Larry Jameson that is here with her wife Michelle and, uh, and uh, who is uh, Larry Jameson? A very influent person because he is executive vice president of the University of Pennsylvania for the Health System and the Dean of Perlman School of Medicine. Um, sono i tre medici che sono venuti qui a trovarci, Padova, Vicenza e Venezia, per onorare questa straordinaria vicenda di questo personaggio che ha fondato poi la scuola di medicina e che è di, di Filadelfia e che ha incontrato anche a Giovanni Battista Morgagni, ne parleremo dopo. Uh, so, uh, they accepted, uh, hanno accettato la nostra invito molto molto volentieri, noi ci sentiamo molto onorati. Uh, now, Larry, to you. 
Good morning, and I, I want to express our appreciation to the Olympic Academy and the University of Padua for hosting us in this historic location. And I want to thank the, the mayor uh, for welcoming us this morning. We look forward to spending more time uh, with him and in the city later today. What I would like to do this morning is to read a portion of a letter from the president of the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Amy Gutman, and I will leave a copy of this letter uh, with you to keep in the archive. To the Olympic Academy of Vicenza, the University of Padua Medical School, and the Veneto Region Council, thank you for warmly welcoming our delegation from the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Tian, I'm especially grateful for your friendship and collaborative ties that you have helped to forge between the University of Padua and the University of Pennsylvania. Our common bonds span the centuries, going back to the very beginning of modern medicine. It continues, the citizens of Philadelphia and the Penn community prize this cultural heritage that has forever altered the course of medicine in America. The historic links forged by us with uh, John Morgan have gifted us all with a strong affinity and an enduring affection between the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Padua. Of course, our relationship extends to the present day, built on the foundation of cutting edge science and clinically significant work that defines both of our institutions. Our mutual spirit of therapeutic breakthroughs and diagnostic precision in the area of cardiovascular disease, particularly the use of MRI imaging to characterize ARVC, is an exemplar of international scientific cooperation. We applaud the spirit of collaboration, and we now undertake an exchange that promises even brighter future for all of us. You have my very best wishes for a wonderful event, uh, President Amy Gutman. Bene, cominciamo i lavori. Eh, non a caso abbiamo dato un titolo, che è esattamente quello che viene riportato in un messaggio appena letto, cioè The Link between Vicenza e Philadelphia, cioè questo legame storico. Eh, Attuale, molto attuale perché c'è una grande eh, relazione scientifica no, con l'Università di Filadelfia e l'Università di Panama. Bene, abbiamo, uh, come c'è adesso, Howard Burns purtroppo non può essere qui e ho chiesto ad Antonio Frantina che è un press agent, diciamo così, della, della regione Veneto ed è un straordinario vicentino di cui siamo molto orgogliosi che occupi questa posizione a Venezia, che ha portato con sé, che presenterà adesso, un video di intervista proprio con Howard Burns e questo rapporto che c'è stato fra Palladio e Thomas Jefferson che fra l'altro voi sapete è quello che ha scritto l'atto di indipendenza a suo tempo proprio nel 1772-73 eh, sarà con lui a moderare Victor Ferrari che è italiano in origine però non sa così bene l'italiano è inglese sarà lui che ci introdurrà poi il speaker eh, quando arriverà Guido per i bambini invece sarà Antonio ah, che lo presenterà. Ah, chiamo adesso dei due qui come moderatori e vi affido il compito della sessione. sostituire 
professor Paranza è praticamente impossibile, ma eh, portiamo la sua testimonianza attraverso un breve documentario, dura una quindicina di minuti, che abbiamo realizzato come Consiglio regionale del Veneto in collaborazione col Palladio Museum sul tema Palladio Jefferson la nascita di una nuova grande nazione. Direi che può partire il, il video. Slotted elements from 
the villa Cornaro into the elevation of the Villa Pisana at Montagna. So to that central portion of the villa here, he added the low wings, lower than the central block, which you see in the uh, villa, the villa uh, This way of cutting and pasting is typical of his approach to Bologna. He didn't just copy one building and try and reproduce it. He took bits from different buildings and with some skill and judgment put them together. This, interestingly, is the approach which he took to the real Bible. He said Bologna was his Bible. And uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Institution in Washington, his copy of the Gospels is preserved. And what he did was he took uh, printed versions of the Gospels, he cut out all the passages in which there were miracles or things that he considered irrational or superstitious, and left what he thought was good. So that was a cut and paste operation too. He was making his new Bible out of the old Bible, and he did the same with Andrea Palladio. He thought that Palladio in architecture represented, represented a distillation of all that was good in ancient Roman architecture. And for him too, uh, the uh, political thinking and institutions of the Greeks and Romans, the form of democracy, uh, the existence of a Senate and so on, were very important for determining the basis for the new democracy the, of the new republic uh, of the United States. Jefferson has a double role really in the creation of this new country with its new institutions and its new ideals. One is at the level of establishing the basic principles. Uh, he was the main writer of the famous Declaration of Independence and also of drafting the Constitution and activating a whole new political system. He also, we should remember, was the third president. He was head of state, having occupied the high offices of Secretary of State, then the Vice President, and then of President of the United States. Previously, he had been governor of his own state, the state of Britain. So he was one of the creators of the country. But he realized that this new country needed to house its institutions, a house for the president, uh, the buildings for, for the Congress, the buildings for the state assemblies, like that of the state of Virginia, which he designed himself. Right at the end of his life, he made an enormous contribution to the form of university buildings in the United States, and of course that has spread to, to the rest of the world. Jefferson invented the American University campus. He said the university should be an academical village and his idea for this academical village was a long, broad strip of land uh, surrounded by colonnades. The colonnades linked the houses of the professors. Behind the colonnades were the rooms for the students. So you have the whole community living in these houses and the individual rooms of the students. And at the end of this long prospect was a building that looked like the Pantheon, based on Palladio's publication of the, the Pantheon. And in that was a main assembly room for the university and the university library. So this was his personal invention. Jefferson was a person of immense curiosity. Uh, from when he was a young man, from when he was a student, he was buying books his personal library, an enormous library, 
uh, was the foundation for the Library of Congress because he, he sold it uh, to the nation once the uh, initial Library of Congress had been burned, I'm afraid to say, by the British people in Britain, in 1812 when they attacked Washington. And he bought many architectural books. So he had the books of Servio, Vignola, uh, Scomozzi, uh, copies of Vitruvius, and then more recent writers, the French architectural treatises, up to publications of recently built houses in Germany and in Paris. And in fact, uh, you can see from the model, the old Monticello had two full floors. Uh, once, once Jefferson got back from Paris, he said, uh, well, the, the new nice houses in Paris have only got one living floor. So he demolished the whole top floor, but he extended it at the side, so he didn't lose lose space. In a recent uh, study, I have argued that very important for him was the book on architecture, on modern architecture, of Isaac Ware, who translated, translated Palladio into English, and who is one of the innovatory architects of the middle of the 18th century in England who introduced into domestic architecture features which you do not find in Palladio's architecture. That is uh, the use of tangled rooms and of rooms which end with three walls bent round, giving you an absolute which Jefferson liked of the countryside. And he took over, even in Monticello already, you can see this uh, part of Monticello emerging behind the portico. You can look for all your life <laughs> for a Palladio villa with that, and you'll never find it, and you'll never find it in the book. It comes from the new text, which we could call a sort of post-Palladian architecture in England. In so he follows Palladio in some things, in other things he follows English mid 18th century fashion. And in, then, when he rethinks his house and rethinks domestic architecture, he follows the French mode for just one main living floor in the house. He made himself an architect because he uh, grew up uh, and got interested in, in building in a world where there were almost no trained architects available. The, not only that, but it was very hard to find a good bricklayer or, or a good carpenter. And Jefferson was not only someone who could make excellent architectural designs and drawings, but he was very good in carpentry. He was a very skilled lockmaker. He could do all sorts of things with his hands. And he taught craftsmen, very often his own slaves, how to do these difficult things, which he learned himself by finding someone who could do it and reading the books and learning to do it himself. So that he was always working, lots of tools, always making things himself. He also was highly inventive um, in technical matters in, with building, because he, he liked to have terraces and flat roofs and he found ways, whether they always worked or not, is another question, of putting skylights in his building uh, so that in his second house, which he built later in his life, Poplar Forest, um, it's an octagon, in the middle is a square room, the most important room, which is the dining room. Uh, it is no direct light uh, from the outside of the building, but there's a big skylight which you have to put in. And he worked out ingenious ways of having a drainage system underneath terraces so that the water that seeped through between the tiles could be carried, carried away. He also invented a door so that if you took one side of a door, double door, they would both open. And he had this convenient, ingenious uh, system for a little lift 
that could bring the wine bottles at Monticello, it still exists, up to where he was sitting reading a book by the fire in the evening because he liked, he liked his glass of wine. And he, saw, he was always buying books, but he was also always buying wine. I don't think he ever met Canova, but he was very much in touch with architectural and artistic developments in Europe. Uh, so he got uh, Claire Soul, for instance, to make the, the model for the state uh, assembly in, in Virginia. His bust was made by Houdon, uh, who he said is the finest artist now living in the world. And in, in fact, the, the four busts we have by Houdon of Washington, Lafayette, uh, Franklin, and, and Jefferson are fantastic in Houdon's ability to to capture the personality. Jefferson, with his little, his little smile, a little bit repressed, a little bit knowing, a little bit calculating, you can, you can see him absolutely there. If you see Houdon's past, you see, you see Jefferson there. And he, he knew the fame of Canova, he must have seen reproductions of his works, so he thought, we've got to go for the best. Canova's the best. We should remember, uh, speaking as we are in, in the Veneto, that the Republic in Europe, uh, before, before the United States was invented and created, the most important Republic uh, was, was Venice. It's not. Uh, Venice had an elected, an elected head of state. It wasn't, it wasn't a king, it wasn't royal. And Venice also had a, had a Senate. Uh, so there is this connection between the Veneto and the United States. And it was one of the models which was looked at very carefully by Jefferson and John Adams and their contemporaries when they were trying to think how should we organize this, this new uh, political entity. certo guardare né all'impero tedesco né a, tantomeno al Regno Unito o alla, al Regno Francese. Avevano come unico modello di Repubblica la Repubblica di Venezia e eh, questo è un dato molto importante. Eh, diciamo al tramonto della Repubblica di Venezia corrisponde la nascita di una nuova grande nazione. Il leone marciano, il leone di Venezia, va a riposare, nasce l'aquila statunitense. Secondo punto, e guardate che anche questo non è, rientra perfettamente nell'ambito 
del, dell'incontro odierno è la prassi per l'intelligenza europea venire in Italia e completare la propria formazione culturale. Il, più, il caso più classico è quello di Goethe che viene, viene anche qui a Vicenza, viene in quest'aula, andrà nel Teatro Olimpico, anche lui come voi parteciperà ad una lezione dell'Accademia Olimpica, verrà a Venezia perché il viaggio in Italia era il momento diciamo, di eh, formazione conclusiva dell'intellettuale. Ultima cosa, perché se no vi rubo troppo tempo, non dimentichiamo, domani ve la ripeterò, non dimentichiamo che Venezia e la Repubblica di Venezia era stata la prima realtà che aveva fornito un servizio di sanità pubblica a partire dal Medioevo. Negli stessi anni in cui vive Andrea Palladio, la Repubblica realizza a Padova e lo mette sotto il controllo dell'Università Padovana il primo orto botanico, cioè la raccolta delle erbe medicinali che dovevano essere sottratte ai ciarlatani e messe sotto il controllo della scienza. Contemporaneamente realizzerà sempre all'Università di Padova il primo teatro anatomico, cosa che non era possibile fare in qualunque altra parte d'Europa visto l'opposizione della Chiesa. E quindi vedete come sin dal passato il legame profondo tra la Repubblica e l'Università di Padova, soprattutto nel campo della medicina, era particolarmente importante e qualificante la vita della nazione. Ho detto fin troppo, lascio la parola. Thank you very much for a lovely introduction. And we'll move forward with the program now. However, I, I think we, uh, sitting in this beautiful room, we understand best, I think, the connection between art, science, and creative thinking. One of the best examples of that, I think, we can I've had my career is meeting Professor Gaetano Tien. I think among the leaders in European and world medicine, he is absolutely remarkable. Short bit about his background, he took his uh, MD at the University of Padua, then postgraduate education in cardiology and in pathological anatomy. Padua then Trieste. His most um, prominent role has been, uh, was the director of the cardiovascular pathology unit at Padua from 1990 to 2017. Afterwards, because of his love and expertise in uh, the history of medicine, he was dep deputy counselor for historical tradition and the international image of the medical school at the University of Padua. His list of accolades and awards is too long to list here, but uh, I'll mention that he was, he's an honorary fellow of the Royal College of Physicians. He has uh, distinguished himself among the cardiovascular pathologists in the world. Uh, he was the Paul Dudley White International Lecture and Award winner at the American Heart Association, the Leonardo da Vinci, Also, the Michael Davies Distinguished Achievement Award winner. And uh, he has been the uh, leader of the group in Padua that has um, uh, screened for multiple genetic defects and transformed the treatment of arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, provided medical screening to young athletes, and uh, decreased the mortality related to this uh, disorder by nearly 90% and made the world safer for Italian athletes. 
Finally, I'll mention that uh, his papers collected an H index of 119, and they've been cited nearly 75,000 times in Google Scholar citations. Without further ado, my good friend and remarkable uh, physician, Dr. Tiani, who will tell us about John Morgan's journey in Italy and his visit to the Teatri Olympicorum. Professor Tiani. Thank you very much. Now, my position is not of president of the Academy of the Scientists, speaking of a scientist of three centuries ago. And this is a, a personage that is unique to my mind, and we have to be very honored that he visited Vicenza, he visited also the Teatro Moritino. Look, look at here, I just was telling we were can we have a light of 7 August 1764? 7 August is my name day, by the way. And uh, this is what I mentioned. I knew it the several elegant palaces built by Palladio. Charmed, it was fascinated by the Diablo I, I was exhibited after the manner of the ancient by the same palladio of the latter I procured a pretty exact play, Modellino. And finally it is the cathedral where the council of Holy Father, whose Giglio di Trento, should be convened but was assembled in Trento, it was initially the idea was to be to be here in the center, place in the middle, middle of the world, so that religion might spread to the ends of the world. That was uh, the official explanation of the choice of, of Trento. Well, he was born in 17, 1735 in Philadelphia, was, was of Welsh in origin, and uh, the ancestry was of uh, the Quaker and arrived in America with them. He was educated in Latin and Greek, Latin and Greek in Philadelphia. Six years of apprenticeship, because uh, so that was the way to become doctor. Apprenticeship, not a, a degree and the doctor John Bradman. Of course he achieved a bachelor of art, but that does not mean that he was special in medicine. Came to England, Spent a year with the Anders, the famous brothers and the surgeon, and moved to Edinburgh, where uh, that time was the most important school of clinical medicine, and then finally he achieved uh, the Harvey degree with the basis on PUS. Of all reasons, let me look at the, these are the Anders, the famous surgeon, and this is the basis. Uh, a thesis that left a copy in Padua to Morgan. Morgan. Uh, the, was the first in the history of medicine that had the intuition and proved that, that the pus is coming from blood cells. Okay, so he was promoted a royal college physician in London and Edinburgh and, and then started a trip to, to Europe and then finally to Italy. In Paris, he stopped there. By the way, he received immediately a membership of the Academia Royale de Chirurgy, and then in the south towards Italy. Okay, I want to, to, to show you is a court of arm. He invented the court of arm for himself. But it is very important to see that this is a winged dragon. Dragon. Is English. So he, he loved it. There is no, no doubt about that. Okay, so this is, uh, we are July 6, 1764, when we start this type of journey up to Venice, Padua, Vicenza, and others. With the nose, the driver was called Vittorino. I can tell you this was a system of taxi that was very effective at that time. 
indeed, what he was changing this type of, of carriage town by town. And, and then he stopped it. Uh, by the way, I want just to mention Geneva, because in, in G Lyon, Geneva, I don't remember exactly, it is the, the Voltaire. Even Voltaire again. Okay, and this is the journal. He wrote the journal. The quality of writing of this journal, I can tell you, day by day, visit by visit, the day in Italy, is a high quality. Is equal to the ability of Galileo Galilei of writing. Well, the journal, journal means diary of John Morgan in this uh, visit and uh, this journal. Well, he had a companion that he was he was from Philadelphia, a congenial friend and fellow town man. He was he paid a lot of interest upon any type of culture, art, architecture, and medicine, of course, and he, he, he bought a lot and an amount, a great amount of items that he shipped to London and, and eventually back to Philadelphia. I, I think that in any, any town he purchased a lot of things. Well, and now he meets Morgagni in Parma. This is the key uh, point of his travel. I want to pay my respect to the celebrated Morgagni, very famous prince of, uh, of anatomy in Europe, professor of anatomy in Parma. That was a strong will to see this very famous anatomy. And look at here, he received me with the greatest poli politeness, imagine, and showing me abundance civilis. Civilis means gentilezza. And this is the famous book of Morgani, published three years earlier, and what the Civilis of Gaudis Morgani. That is in, in the fame of this book, diffused in Europe everywhere. And so, and arrived in Edinburgh, arrived in London, and he wanted to meet the author. Look at here, this is so important, this book, that even the Encyclopedia Americana said, the Sergius and Causis Marborum per Anatomia in 1761, established pathological anatomy as a science. We are moving from art to science, thus changing the course of medical diagnosis. Besides, everybody agreed that he, is the, he was the founder of modern medicine. Okay, then you wrote Padova. Why to visit Padova apart from Morgana? Padova was characterized by civil and religious freedom, no doubt, value and fame of professors, Latin as international language. International language nowadays is English, but that time was Latin, and his thesis was written in Latin. Availability of cadavers for research. Uh, I have, I have to, to underline that the church was not against dissection. The Roman were against dissection of the human body, but not the church. Absolutely not. Outstanding tradition of anatomy, the famous Besalius, Colombo, Fallopius, Fabrizio da Pendente, and these are the, these paintings belonged to Morgani, and he displayed and showed it to Morgan because this was a personal collection that was left now to the you have seen when you visited the the Padua, the, the whole of the School of Medicine. And they are, but initially the property was of Morgan. And this is where he worked. He worked in the famous anatomical theater built in 1594-95 by Fabrizio da Pendente, the place where Morse guarded the structure of the And there is a bust there 
that was enacted by the uh, German students uh, as a memory forever of Morgan. Indeed, now Morgan is remembered inside, even inside this album theater. But I, I would like to now to show you briefly. Morgani arrived in Padua at the only age of 29. It is important to stress this a great opportunity that have young, talented people to become professor very, very early. Vesalius, 23 years. The day after graduation, Vesalius became professor of anatomy. And Galileo had, was 28 when he was called to, to, over, to take over the chair of Metz at the University of Papua. And 29, uh, Morgan. Well, when he had the inaugural lecture, and we were in 1712, uh, he entitled Nova Institution Medicale Maidia. This is a very similar title as the title of the discourse that did later our John Morgan. And eventually he was, at the beginning he was in theoretical medicine, but eventually he had the position of chair of anatomy, the most ambitious chair of the anatomy. Well, and he stated in this book, in this inaugural lecture, we will state that it is impossible to push the nature and cause of any disease without dissection of the cadaver. This was the new method of investigation. Science and medicine started from dissection of the cadaver. For died because of a disease, not died because executed for an investigating product. Well, that was surely the down of our organ pathology. So the ideal physician listen what he believed to be the ideal physician should be perfect in eloquence a scholar of in dialectics confident with maths and philosophy universal culture civil and canonic rights even well educated in anatomy and heroistic and any other branch of medicine as well as skillful to practice medicine so, theoretical and practical method. Uh, indeed, uh, the name of, of doctor in England is practitioner. And not chemical. Okay. But listen, there is something left more. Now, that is the doctor. And what about the lecturer, the professor? Finally, I realized that the assistant to the sick is not enough for this distinguished physician we intended to train, but also he has to help the posterity with our experience and present what he has known with us in a clear and simple manner. Message to the lectures, to the teachers. Well, Morgani method, the comparison between science symptoms and morphological substrates that they was observed at autopsy. That is the so-called clinical pathological relation. But at the end, there is the so-called ethical crisis. That is a final consideration. This is the synthesis. And this is, this method is the one that transformed empiricism in medical science. So, let me show an example. The, AIDS is a very important disease nowadays, but that time was syphilis. And this was a huge example from our museum of anarchism of the aorta because of syphilis. Look at here, the man. This is a picture from the Institute of Cardiology. Diego Rivera was the author. And showing protagonist from part of, of the clinical pathologic correlation. Look at here. This is Montagne. This is Vesaglio. This is Arve. And there are others there. But look at this is a patient 
with a huge protrusion in the chest because of, of a severe aneurysm. And patient visited by Condani. You see here that he has now the heart and the aorta after the autopsy. If you compare this heart, this is heart, with the normal heart of the Zanius, there is a big difference there. The lead is affected the aorta. And he's looking at Harvey with the, 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 the you, you remember this, the proof on, on, on the arm for detecting here the venous valve. And seems to say, you are right, Harvey Bill. Is circulating in the blood. If you rupture it, this simple, you are dead. Unbelievable. And so, at least we have, we have seen probably yesterday, the equivalent specimen in our museum. You see here, ruptured aneurysm here on the sternum and sudden death because of the Well, Morgan meets again, we are speaking of the meeting. They exchange gifts, the thesis from Morgan to Morgani, and a copy of the Sedibus from Morgani to Morgan. But listen here, he is 82 years old. He's right in the journal, in the, in the diary. Reads without glosses. At the age of 82, he didn't need glosses. Uh, and he's alert, like a man of 50 years. Alert is a fantastic. It means smart, it means bright, alert, stable. <coughs> okay, these are the exchange with the signature. This is now in the collection at the San Biagio uh, University Library in Padova because Morgani left all these books to the library then as a legacy, as a will. And this is what Morgani wrote uh, as an indication of this book to Morgan. We found with Victor in the library of the Medical College in Philadelphia. To me, it was very touching. I did not expect that. So, Vero Celeberrimo means Celeberrimo Vero was Morgan. Ioanne Battista Morgani and an humilite offer, humili humble, humilite offer, and it's not signed Morgani. No, the fashion that time was signing the auto. So, if you write a book, and, and then we would like to donate to some friend. No, there is no need to sign with your name. No, you are the author. And, uh, okay, so, and this is uh, um, the other, okay. He visited also when he was in Padua, the old justice. I like that the horse of Donatello, he called Trojan horse, the big one. The squares of gentlemen and vegetables, the Botan Garden, the St. Anthony and St. Justin churches, the hospital of San Francisco. 200 beds. The Justinianeo was not yet built. Look at here the sentence. Morgan expresses concern on clinical medicine in Italy. San Francisco Hospital was like a Lazzaretto. Nasty, nasty hospital, with the exception of the general hospital in Milan. Yes, indeed, he recognized that in Milan there was the first and largest hospital I have ever seen in the country, with 1,080 hospitalized six patients. Okay, so uh, he was back to London, finished the this, this is fantastic. Thing. Tour uh, of Venice, I will speak more. Okay? And uh, uh, he writes the discourse. Now, this is a very important book later on, that is uh, the, the theoretical best way to, to educate a, a doctor. 
Uh, he was uh, back to Philadelphia. He advances to the board, to the board of trustees. I underlined that the name trustees was still existing at that time. We have several trustees here uh, as a guest. And uh, the plan of a medical school. Thank you, man. Plan of a medical school to become connected with the university. In other words, becoming academic. And was nominated uh, the, the month later uh, professor of theory and practice of medicine and uh, uh, presented uh, as a commencement lecture, inaugural lecture, the discourse among the institution of the medical school in America. And for the first time, it was superior even to the model in power. That is a different qualification. Physic is a MD, surgeon not yet a different profession, pharmacy, apothecary, different profession. And only physic deserved the, the MD, the graduation. And they say, this is, I have to teach science of medicine. Is using again the term science of medicine, anatomy, physiology, pathology, botany, chemistry, theory, and practice of physics. To my mind, well over to the same time. And this is uh, the, the, the discourse that uh, now we have a book that I have seen as a gift from, from Victor. And he adopted uh, a definition of medicine from Gaudius. It was uh, a European one, it was coming from uh, the Netherlands. Medicine is the guardian of life and health against death and disease. I think that is, this is the best definition of our law. The fight against death and disease. And this is uh, the composition of science medicine, anatomy, frame the organization of the body. And then materia medica, botany, botany, chemistry, physiology, function of the living bodies. I like that. Listen, this, of course, was, that one was written, of course, not in Latin, it was written directly in English, but animate, animated anatomy. In other words, the physiology is animated anatomy. Pathology, function of the United State and of practice medicine. The method of curing the disease and alleviating the disease. This is uh, the comparison between the two. The discourse of Morgan and the institution of medical idea that was done uh, nearly 50 years earlier. Can I say after the meeting with Morgani, he realized that pathology is the seeds of the disease, is a very capital part of medical, medical knowledge. Without this knowledge, without this knowledge, is more, is more than the, we have no better right to take upon the cure of the disease than a blind man to judge a colos or a deaf man of science. And can you compare what the, what the wrote and say that Morgani? Oh, the last autopsy is the last medical service. The two physicians that have performed a seen several dissection have learned at least to question their diagnosis. Uh, otherwise, they live within the clouds of the unfermented unconfirmed illusion. Similar. No doubt. Uh, now, the second commencement lecture. Probably you are not aware that in the second commencement lecture was entitled Dissection. Listen, it was not in favor to separate from the Great Union. He said, um, this dissection on the, the reciprocal advantage of a perpetual, a perpetual a, a 
advantage of a perpetual union between Great Britain and American colonies. Few later, years later, there was a declaration of independence, but basically it was a European, I must say, because of all the training that did, the people that met, the German that did. The, the, uh, so, we are very close to the, at the end. He marries uh, Mary Hopkins, founds uh, the American philosophy of society, starts 75. 75 is the word of the British declared on Great Britain, appointed, uh, he was appointed, listen, as a physician in chief of the American army. He was the, the chief of the American army. But unfortunately, he had, was dismissed by General Washington because of complaints of his very, uh, very close friend, unfortunately, uh, not any, I would say, by certain shipmen that he, I would say is personal for other than opponent. Uh, and, but uh, eventually, too much name takes uh, two years. Uh, there was a resolution, the Congress are satisfied with the conduct of the John Morgan while acting as a director and general and physician in chief of the general hospitals of the United States. Too late, because he was psychologically destroyed. And indeed, in a, uh, the Mary dies, 85, 89 follows her at the early age of 54. Only 54. He died. He, he, they are buried. We, know, we are discussing now whether we will have the possibility to find the remains there in St. Peter Church in Philadelphia. His career, so brilliant at the beginning, ended shut along and disgraced. So, Victor, while writing a paper uh, on uh, John Morgan and the story, he said, This is a Greek tragedy. What a better place as the year to speak about the, the tragedy of John Morgan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tini. This is terrific. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Larry Jameson, who is the uh, Executive Vice President of the University of Pennsylvania and the Dean of the School of Medicine. Dr. Jameson is in his second term of, uh, as Dean, and he, uh, like Morgan, has uh, delivered uh, two strategic plans to the uh, uh, University President, uh, which uh, have been transformative in the uh, direction and goals of the School of Medicine. Uh, Larry is a, a wonderful communicator. He's uh, a, a very logical thinker and has been able to uh, direct, lead our School of Medicine in a, uh, uh, in a direction that uh, can be nothing less than truly transformative. Uh, Larry has uh, uh, broken down barriers, led uh, the faculty uh, to new heights, and um, the School of Medicine is now one of the elite universities, uh, schools of medicine in the world. Dr. Jameson will give us a uh, talk on Benjamin Franklin and the visionary plan of a medical school in America, and as Dr. Uh, Tiani mentioned to me a few days ago, he feels that Dr. Jameson is the Franklin of our time at the University of Pennsylvania. With no further ado, Dr. Jameson. Well, we've had a chance uh, to hear a lot about John Morgan, and we've had a chance to hear a lot about Morgane and the visit here to Padua. But I'm going to tell the rest of the story. So the rest of the story is, how did John Morgan get assigned the task of creating a medical school in America? 
And how did he receive the connections that we've heard so much about? Uh, because there's no way without introductions to the right people and the right places that any of this would have happened. And so my story will be about Benjamin Franklin. And for the Americans, uh, he's a familiar figure. Uh, for the Italians, I'm sure you've heard about him. But there's a lot more that all of us can learn about Benjamin Franklin. So I'm going to explain not only his connection with John Morgan, but also his connection more broadly with medicine and science. So here are some portraits of Benjamin Franklin, beginning with his youngest one at about age 40. Uh, on the far left, uh, this is Benjamin Franklin at the time he retired as a printer. So he retired at age 42, a very wealthy man, uh, because he had published the Pennsylvania Gazette. Uh, he was a, a famous uh, author. Sometimes he uh, used a pseudonym, uh, sometimes not. Uh, and he, he set up his business so that he continued to receive uh, royalties from the printing of, of these magazines, and he had a number of inventions. But the reason it was important for him to retire was so he could now focus on the next uh, features of his career, which was to be a scientist, and then ultimately a civic leader. And the order is important because the wealth gave him the luxury of being a scientist, and the scientist gave him the reputation to be a civic leader. And so you see in the rest of the, of the portraits, uh, this is uh, as French ambassador. You can see he also was very famous in Europe for wearing uh, this fur hat that uh, designated him as part of the American pioneer spirit. And then we've got a series of, uh, of, of portraits that really capture his role as a scientist and his experiments with electricity. Uh, this is with Isaac Newton's uh, statue in the background, and this is a, a famous uh, portrait for his electrical experiments. So Benjamin Franklin was born in the city of Boston. Uh, his father had 17 children uh, from two different wives. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was the next to youngest, uh, and originally he was to go to Harvard and become uh, a priest. But his father didn't have any money after having so many children. So instead, he was indentured to his older brother. And his older brother was in favor of, of not having uh, smallpox uh, vaccinations done. And uh, Benjamin Franklin had read, particularly from Cotton Mather, a number of books about health and wellness and was more on the side of uh, favoring the vaccinations, and in, in many different areas, uh, they had some conflict. So at age 17, Benjamin Franklin ran away from home and uh, came to Philadelphia. And at the time, uh, this was around uh, 1720, uh, Philadelphia was a very small village. It, it had maybe 3,000 people, but it was growing quickly. And Philadelphia soon became the, the heart of many uh, civic and political activities in America, uh, ultimately becoming a, a city of about 25,000 when Benjamin Franklin was at his, at his peak in Philadelphia. But by comparison, you know, London at that time was 750,000. So still, from a global perspective, a small city. So this is the, the city that Philadelphia was when Franklin was there, you see the Delaware River. This is Market Street. And really, the city was just a few blocks on either side of Market Street. Uh, this is his original home. It no longer exists. Uh, 
This is Independence Hall. This is where the Continental uh, Congress took place. It does still exist, so if you have a chance to visit Philadelphia, uh, Independence Hall is a must place to see, and very close by is the Liberty Bell. So Benjamin Franklin was a very connected man. Uh, he had friends who were scientists, politicians, but in particular, a number of people who were physicians. And you've heard about uh, many of these people. So uh, John Morgan was much younger than Benjamin Franklin, uh, but Thomas Bond was one of his peers. And you'll see later on that Thomas Bond and Benjamin Franklin uh, together founded a number of organizations in Philadelphia, including the first hospital uh, in America. And you see some of the, the people that we've uh, heard about, the, the hunters uh, in London who trained uh, John Morgan in, in clinical medicine. And you'll see some pamphlets later uh, with, with Heberden. Uh, Collinson uh, was a botanist, a very famous botanist that exchanged letters uh, back and forth with, uh, with Benjamin Franklin. And he also had uh, scientist friends in, in France like uh, Lavoisier. So we owe so much uh, in America to Benjamin Franklin because he founded a number of different uh, important societies, including uh, what is now the University of Pennsylvania. It began as the Academy of, of Pennsylvania in 1749. Um, but when the medical school was added, then it became a university because it had more than one college associated with it. And in the beginning, uh, the sites for surgery, this is where uh, Shippen was practicing surgery. This is one of the tickets to his lectures. This is where the, the medical school was based, uh, physically separate at that time, uh, surgery and medicine. Pennsylvania Hospital actually preceded the medical school by almost 10 years. And Thomas Bond, uh, who was a, a physician in Philadelphia, uh, felt that there was a need to have a site of clinical care. And there were two locations at the time. Uh, there was an almshouse for the poor, that's uh, shown in, in this uh, photograph to the left, and then uh, Pennsylvania Hospital uh, which is still associated with the University of, of Pennsylvania and our, our health system, uh, was officially uh, authorized in 1751, uh, but it, it opened in 1755. And you see the uh, inscription here, this is a cornerstone that you can, can see in the building today, uh, written by Benjamin Franklin, George II, happily reigning, in parentheses, for he sought the happiness of his people, close parentheses. <laughs> so this predated uh, the Declaration of Independence a little bit, but you can see uh, that the spirit uh, was there early on. Now, there's a famous story about the funding of Pennsylvania Hospital. So Benjamin Franklin was terrific at raising money. He raised money for the library. Uh, he, he, was, he was able to get people to donate books and then have an annual subscription to the library, which if you think about it, was an incredibly clever idea because most people weren't wealthy enough uh, to have a large collection of books like we heard about for Thomas Jefferson. Uh, but if you pooled your books, and then if you kept investing over time, uh, there would be more availability. Uh, he also founded uh, a fire station, an insurance company, uh, what's the equivalent of the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA. Uh, we'll hear later about the American Philosophical uh, Society. But for Pennsylvania Hospital, his strategy was to get the Pennsylvania State uh, Legislature uh, to help fund the hospital. And so he made an agreement that if he could raise what is the equivalent of 2,000 pounds, that they would match it. And 
the legislature didn't think he could raise that much money, so they agreed. But he actually raised more than, than 2000 and they needed to match it. And so, in, in some ways, uh, he, he, called, he, he thought it was a bluff, they thought it was a bluff, uh, but it was called. Now, what he's most famous for, uh, and it really had a huge impact on his career trajectory, were these electrical experiments. Uh, he was a rigorous scientist, and I'm going to show you two or three examples. At this time, around 1750, there was a lot of controversy about electricity. People knew about static electricity, and you could capture static electricity in, in a widened jar. And there was a question about whether static electricity and lightning bolts uh, were the same. Were they the same phenomenon? And so, completely on theoretical grounds, uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote a patent for what is today the lightning rod, where he, he drew a design where you would have a, a pole on top of a house that would then you know, drive electricity down into the ground. It predated any of these experiments. And as I mentioned before, he also founded the, the fire department and the insurance company associated with the fire department. He was very concerned about houses uh, burning down. And he had two ideas for the experiment. Uh, the, the first is this man in a sentry box. And again, he drew up the experiment. He was going to have the sentry box go on top of a church that was being built in Philadelphia. And it would be eventually struck by lightning during the storm. And the man in the box would have the, the light in jar and try to capture the current. But this experiment never happened uh, because there was a delay in building the church. Now, it was actually performed in France at about the same time as the kite experiment. But because of the delay, uh, he designed a, a kite. It was a, a, a fairly ingenious kite because it, it had a metal rod uh, on, the, on one end and the string that was attached to the kite was made out of a material that would conduct electricity and then it came down to a key uh, that was in the light jar. And he had an assistant uh, who I think got sort of mildly uh, struck by the lightning bolt, <laughs> but it was, it was conducted through this other, other source. And he wrote this paper that really proved that lightning and static electricity were the same. And so he became very famous, uh, both for the creativity associated with this experiment, but also the, the rigor uh, to which it was done. Now, I just, to give you the feeling of 1750, there were people who thought that, uh, that strokes might be treated with electricity. And again, in, in France uh, and other countries, people were using electric, electrical fish uh, to shock uh, patients who had had a stroke uh, with the idea that you might, you might cure the paralyzed limb. And so uh, Benjamin Franklin eventually carried out randomized experiments using charged uh, electrical systems like the Leiden jar and he concluded and, and wrote in his uh, paper on this that while people might sense a transient effect, I would conclude that that's either because of the effort they exerted uh, to walk to my office for the experiment or perhaps it was their imagination basically describing a placebo effect. But he said, there's no evidence I can find that electricity is useful either for strokes or for depression. Now, these days, uh, you know, we've, we've seen electroshock therapy uh, used for depression. Uh, but maybe he didn't have enough, a current, enough current or didn't uh, put it in the right location. So he was also very focused on, on healthful living, and it goes all the way back uh, to material that, that he read as a young man. And he often would list virtues of, of healthful living. And I'm, I'm going to describe a few examples. Uh, but every morning when he woke up, uh, 
Uh, he would sit in front of an open window for a half an hour and read, usually naked, because it would like, stimulate his circulation and uh, wake him up and make him more vibrant. Uh, for a long time, he was a vegetarian. Uh, then he just ate small amounts of meat. He uh, advocated through uh, Poor Richard, uh, moderation and everything. He exercised every day. And although most of the portraits that we see are those of him later in life as a rotund man sitting at a desk, uh, he, was, he was very vigorous. Uh, he learned to swim early in life in the Charles River in Boston. And when he was in London, uh, at one point, he swam two miles in the Thames River. Uh, he invented paddles uh, to allow you to swim more quickly. And you'll, you'll see uh, some of these inventions, but it's important. Uh, I just want to, here's the paddle, the, the, the swimming, and examples of, of his uh, Poor Richard's publications. This one is interesting because he had corresponded with the inventor of photosynthesis in France and concluded that if you planted trees around your house, that it would purify the air. So he advocated for gardens and trees, uh, even before you know, we, we knew that much about how it would work. Uh, the, John Adams, in his autobiography, uh, wrote this famous uh, story about when John Adams had a cold and he was sleeping in the same bed uh, with Benjamin Franklin when they were traveling to the Continental Congress, they had an argument about whether the window should be opened or closed. And uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, believed, uh, for many reasons, that, uh, that common colds were transmissible from one person to the next and that the window should be open, including in the hospital. So it was one of the things that he supported uh, in the hospital. And you know, Adams tells the story about uh, the harangue of Benjamin Franklin, hearing about opening windows and cold air, and it eventually put him to sleep. Uh, but he, he thought about it rigorously. So an example is that when he traveled on the ships from America to Europe, he, he noticed that even though the sailors were wet and cold, uh, they, they rarely had a cold. And so he, he thought that it was the concentration of people and that the, that the air became saturated, contaminated, basically, with things that you had to purify uh, by opening windows or avoiding people who were ill or planting trees. Uh, he had a lot of correspondence about lead poisoning, again, based largely on his personal experience as a printer. So as a printer, he noticed that many of the people in the trade developed lead poisoning from dealing with the, with the plates and some of the materials. And papers were uh, eventually uh, written about this. He also knew that people who distilled uh, alcohol and created rum and pewter uh, materials that had lead uh, developed lead poisoning. And so he, he advocated that, uh, that stills be used with metals that, like tin uh, that didn't have any lead in them, and he turned out to be right about that. Uh, his son, who's depicted here, uh, died of smallpox, and Benjamin Franklin had seen the smallpox outbreak in, in Boston in 1715, and he was planning to vaccinate his son, uh, but he got some kind of diarrheal illness, and he thought he was too ill to get the vaccination, so that was, was too late. Uh, but he wrote, uh, the introduction to this uh, famous uh, paper on inoculation for smallpox. The purpose of this paper was to advocate that parents should inoculate their children and doctors should inoculate their children so that there would be more trust in the process. And it also was a, a, a way to lower the cost. So he would try to raise money for poor people to also get a smallpox vaccination because he knew that it was uh, a, cont uh, a contagious disease. And in the introduction, you know, I've got copied here uh, a statistical analysis that Benjamin Franklin did in the introduction that demonstrated the value of the vaccine. So he compared the death rate of people who contracted smallpox 
uh, whether they had been vaccinated or not, and whether and by race. So were they white? Were they black? And it turns out that in this statistical analysis, which you can't read, it showed a 50% reduction of death rates in those who had received the smallpox vaccine. He was asked uh, by one of the kings to investigate the phenomenon of mesmerism. Uh, this was an idea that uh, Franz Mesmer had advocated that that magnets uh, could be used to cure disease, that magnetism could be used to cure disease. And so he did a double-blind experiment and then wrote this paper where both the person giving the, the treatment and those receiving it were blindfolded, literally, and then they were treated, and then, you know, symptoms were evaluated. And you can read, uh, you know, his conclusion. So. Uh, you, you see this, this scientific rigor throughout Benjamin Franklin's uh, career, whether it's with smallpox, electricity, uh, mesmerism. Uh, this, this kind of rigor is really why he was so famous. So he had a lot of medical inventions. Uh, he had two sets of glasses, whether he was trying to see at a distance or read up close. So he created, probably not the only one, but created the bifocal, uh, so he could use one pair of glasses for, for both. Uh, his brother had a bladder stone, and so he created a flexible catheter that was made of small uh, the pieces of silver linked together and then uh, coated with animal hide so that it would be flexible to allow him to catheterize himself. And then later in life, he developed severe gout and needed to be transported you know, by a chair back and forth to the Continental Congress. And so he invented these uh, long arm graspers so that he could pull books down you know, off, the, off the bookshelf. So a very practical uh, in inventor. So this is the statue of Benjamin Franklin that we have at the University of Pennsylvania in front of President Gutman's office in College Hall. I think in what I've tried to share, uh, he not only uh, gave the instruction uh, to John Morgan to go to Edinburgh, to train in London, to go to Padua, he provided those introductions to him, but he was deeply interested in medicine, founding Pennsylvania Hospital, uh, developing theories about the transmissibility of cold, the importance of open air, uh, the importance of trees to clear, clean the air, ideas about lead poisoning, inventions like the bifocal, the flexible catheter, and so I, I think a very impressive uh, person in our field, and, and in some ways doesn't always get the credit in medicine because his civic activities so profoundly overshadow him. So one more person to add uh, to this story. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jameson. That uh, will bring to a close uh, this part of the day. And uh, we want to thank you all for uh, joining us here uh, this morning, especially the, uh, the members of the Olympic Academy, and uh, for being such wonderful hosts uh, to us today. So, thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you again. Museum uh, and uh, Mr. Bertramini can't arrive uh, and he regrets not being here with you. So, but we have uh, enough time uh, to see the theater because Mr. Bertramini, I'm sure, uh, would have tell you uh, the history of the of the theater, which is, uh, I think. Uh, one of the most important monuments in the world. And uh, the creation of the theater 
and also the creation of the Olympic Academy was a, a very important moment uh, in a, a history you have described this morning because uh, there is a strange link between uh, Palladio, Benjamin Franklin and also John Morgan. The idea to teach to the other in a clear a simple way. Palladio wrote his uh, books uh, and you have to think that uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson reading the books of Andrea Palladio was able to establish the new architecture in the United States as well as Benjamin Franklin with his clear way of writing and thinking was, was able to create really a new nation based on the mind, on the science. And this is, I think, the great gift you gave us this morning to believe always in the science and not in the fake news. We are surrounded. <laughs> Grazie per essere intervenuti. I invite now the our guest that we have to visit to the Olympic Theater and soon after upstairs to the Olympic uh, apartment where you have to sign the book of the visitors. Okay? So first to visit to the Olympic Theater. Grazie di tutti per essere intervenuti. Penso che sia stata una cosa unica del suo genere, non è difficile ripetersi. Grazie.